welcome to Come Home. I'm Jen Mallon. May the Lord bless you today. I'm really excited about our program. I so appreciate those of you that faithfully watch, faithfully support, faithfully pray, faithfully give. Because of you and our partnership together, then I am able to do this, bring in just absolutely amazing guests that are doing incredible kingdom adventures. And today we have a great couple that I get to introduce you to. Now you may have seen them, especially if you're feast lovers or if you're music lovers, uh, you, you might be familiar with their ministry. But when I spoke to Tim and Melody on the phone, uh, they said something and my spirit just went, yes, they said it's all about the children in this coming season. And really that's what legacy is. Now I got to be exposed and enjoy their ministry last year uh, during the Feast of Tabernacles at Shiloh Farms. And I just thought, look at this amazing couple and they ministered and they shared and they flowed. And, and uh, as they played, I thought this must have been what it was like when King Saul asked for uh, David to come in and play for him. They just set the atmosphere, the environment, they brought joy, and then they interjected their testimony throughout that time of sharing. And so today we're gonna hear about their life, their ministry, their calling. We're going to hear about their four beautiful boys. I always love boy moms, you know that, and uh, boy families and how all their sons play, but most importantly, just how God is shifting them um, and, and, and focusing them to work with children zero through six and really begin to develop them and cultivate the presence of God in their young little spirits. So stay tuned. This is going to be a, a phenomenal time together. And isn't it appropriate that we are going to Moms on Call uh, for our life hack today, and they're talking about the no stage. The no stage is about asserting one's free will and is a normal developmental milestone. The good news is if your child is saying no frequently, then they're right on track developmentally. The bad news is that it can be frustrating and it requires great patience. Here's what to say. Every time your toddler says no, you say not no, yes ma'am and do it, or yes sir and do it. Then help them to do what you have asked of them. Use confident face and move on. We are basically helping them to know how we handle this in our house. And we may have to say it about 109,000 times. Give or take a few. <laughs> but we confidently and repetitively let them know how we respond to their normal testing of their free will. Now here's what to do. We cannot do a three-point teaching technique every time our child says no. We would have no time left in the day at all. What we want to do is to use this time to prepare them for later in their development. This will not make the no stop. Not right away. <laughs> it will just reset their thinking so that in the future, like after you said this about 109,000 times, and they are three to four years old, they will automatically know the proper response and they will start to respond to it. This is just a learning opportunity. Watch this example. Uh, Jenny, put down that phone, please. No. Not no, yes ma'am, and do it. Yes ma'am. We can use this time to instill the wanted response, which will carry them right into the preteen years. You will get to the point where they say, no, you will raise an eyebrow and they will say, yes ma'am, and do it. So today my guests, Tim and Melody Brock, have lots of boys, just like me. And so they had to learn to say no, and a lot, I'm sure. And I, and I bet there were lots of yeses as well. So thank you so much for being here. I'm so mm, grateful. It's great to be here. It's, okay, <laughs> yeah. reach, reach, reach. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I know some, sometimes it's close, sometimes it's a really far so reach. Right. But thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Uh, last year I was so touched uh, by your ministry. 
and uh, just the way you would play and then testify and then play and then uh, share and then play. And I, I just thought, wow, this is so refreshing. It's so unique. It's so spirit led. Um, it's so professional. It, it was it was a it was a joy. Mm, thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. So how did the two of you um, fall in love with music? <laughs> Well, it started with me early yes. because my mom's a music teacher. Okay, there you go. So she had me playing piano at three, four, and five, and she taught me piano. But once she heard about the Suzuki method, and that's when Dr. Suzuki came from Japan yeah. in the 60s. Now, um, And then I, I started in the early 70s, so it took several times. Yeah. And she had me start in the Suzuki method, and it was so fun because wow. it was like learning a language. I played by ear. I had enough piano in there. I played by ear. And it was just fun to play as a group and play with my friends. But I also had private lessons. So you had friends, uh, private lesson and group classes. And it was just fun. I had the best time. And to boot, I got to go to Japan when I was 11 and meet Dr. Suzuki. Wow. And it was, it was life-changing. Wow, not many people can say that. <laughs> did you get to go too? No, okay. I did not. <laughs> okay, so what's your music story? Well, it was really, you know, it started with exposure to a program at a junior college with uh, jazz and classical guitar. But before that, I really had this explosion that went off in my, in my heart at around 10 o'clock at night when I was in my early teens that I had to play flute. Really? And I was inspired by... Uh, Ian Anderson from Jethro Tull, like, it's okay for a guy to play flute. Because everybody that I saw, it was, it was not that that was bad, but I just didn't see any male role models playing flute. So the flute and the guitar, just the, t the two together, just became a, um, just a good compliment for me. And I studied with this jazz teacher. I felt to let that go for a season and then came back. And it was like a full cycle where I came back and studied classical guitar from what he had exposed me to from being uh, his foundation for jazz was always to start with classical. And so we've kind of ad adopted that, that philosophy with our with, with teaching as well and with our own, you know, our own kids that classical is a good foundation. You can go any direction. So that's, that's how I got back to it. That's awesome. Now, how did, now how did y'all meet and how did both of your individual loves for music become your part of your marriage and your ministry? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'll do the short version. Okay. We went in New York city in, on, at, from, in LaGuardia airport on the bus. So I was coming from LA, which is my hometown. Okay. And he was coming from Florida. We met in the, the, planes met in Cincinnati and then I didn't we were on the same plane but I didn't see him he saw me and then I was hoping she would sit next to me <sighs> but it didn't happen so then you had to be a hunter and go get her <laughs> so right then, then we didn't even see each other we got on the bus randomly supposedly and boom I recognized the, her. the student way of getting into the city we were both studying in in New York City he was studying art wow. and design I was studying music violin and um and it was uphill from there. Wow. And because I was like. I, so I, said, there was... I said to her, so you're studying in the city. I didn't see her violin when she came on the plane, but I saw it when she was on the bus. And she said, well, this is where God has me. Oh. And I said, well, that's, was... that's a good place to be. <laughs> and she was... looked at me like, are you a Christian? <laughs> and I was thinking, how can I convince her? that yeah. I truly am a Christian. Yeah. Were I had, you? I had my Indiana Jones hat okay. and over overcoat. And, well, he had gone you know, to ORU. Anyway. And so anybody oh. that goes to ORU, then I thought, okay, he's legit. He's, he's good. <laughs> Mom would approve, right? <laughs> well, in New York City, you never know, right? I mean, that's we random. We met in a bus, yeah. then we were constantly meeting on street corners. So I really never knew and you know who he was because we were out of context. And yeah. So, but the thankfully... A lot of prayer was going on, I think, from my parents, his parents, and <laughs> the power of prayer. Yeah. Right. And we connected in community. Yeah. That's where we began to kind of see each other, you know, in a different way. Yeah. So that was good. That's special. We need to get back to that. Mm -hmm. We yeah. need to get back to that. So, okay, so you got married. Uh, God has given you four amazing sons. And we settled in St. Pete. Okay. So, so you locally, and yeah. you, you were, a, you taught. At St. Pete College. I taught and worked in the multimedia, uh, in the admin area for multimedia training. 
and uh, with training police officers first, and then later came back with National Terrorism Preparedness Institute, where we were training first responders. Wow. Yeah. That sounds exciting. Yeah. It was very, it was like we could, there was such a shift. When 9-11 happened, I had written the technology plan, and I was expecting feedback that day, and I knew I wasn't going to get it. Everybody oh. was just glued to their screens. And so that was the context for uh, our, our, our program, just like all of a sudden was on fire. Wow. Uh, unfortunately, but that was, that's kind of what it took. <laughs> yeah. Well, how, so, so when you guys got married, you're in St. Pete, you're working, um, but you knew that music had to be part of your children's lives, right? Well, I grew up Suzuki. Yes. And so even though I got a, amazing training, um, I got to use my kids as guinea pigs starting at three years old. Well, they were wanting it. I'd play and I was in the symphony and I'd be practicing my part and they'd want to play. And so I finally was able to get a, a 16th size violin, and oh. I first started, and, and it was all uphill. I, would, I did it all wrong. I had 45-minute lessons when they were five <laughs> years old. Not right, but through the grace of God, I, they, you know, through Suzuki Institutes, actually, we would do family camps in the summer, and they and the teachers would help to train me again <laughs> how to do it well. <laughs> you had to unlearn to relearn, right? <laughs> yes. Well, it's one thing when you're doing it for yourself. It's another thing when you're training someone else. Yeah. Two yeah. totally different things. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So you you all do these family worship camps, right? Yeah, we did one this last summer, and it was a combination Suzuki worship camp. And these are T-shirts that, that, um, that he designed used his design skills, and uh, it, was, it was off the charts. And I tell you, one of the reasons why it was off the charts is because we had at least 20 intercessors, several, a unit here in, uh, in Florida, several of them flew up to Kansas City. We had in wow. Kansas City, Missouri, at the International House of Prayer. The IHOP. And there was prayer cover. That makes such a difference. Because there were about three or four kids that were ready to quit. Aww. And they haven't quit. That's good. And I'm getting goosebumps when <laughs> oh. I say that because there's a lot of warfare against children learning music with the intent of worship. Yeah. And and the enemy does not want that. And no. but we have to cover it in prayer and that that's the key. That's amazing. Well, I've never heard anyone say that their their camp where they were teaching a skill uh needed intercessory prayer so that that's a we beautiful couldn't have thing done it without it yeah we we learned um it was really kind of a god setup where we had our faculty coming in for our first camp that we did in 2015 which was in the morning star area and um, it was interesting we had a catered meal for the faculty and hardly any of the faculty could come because it was just before camp people were still coming from out of town and the intercessors were there to pray for the faculty. Oh. But when the faculty weren't coming, we realized, wait, this, this catered meal is for the intercessors. They oh. are going to play a key role. And they really did. We learned, like, we're never going to do a camp without intercessors again. And every child was on a worship team. They had private lessons. They had group classes. Wow. They had theory. But everyone was on a worship team. And that was their favorite class. That's wonderful. I have a, I, I have, my, my sons are musical, and so I have one that's guitar and one that's, that's keyboard. Huh? They're uh, not multi-instrument, they don't do multiple instruments like you and like your family does, but uh, there's, it kept them uh, in a really good place while, while they were growing up. And, and classical, you know, they had classical teachers. And, of course, they didn't love music theory. Uh, I don't think anyone does. I don't know if adults like it, right? Oh, he does. <laughs> you do? He you does. have that kind of brain, right? Oh, uh, I think once you really start to connect the dots with theory, then it just becomes really something, something yeah. special. Yeah. yeah. And the Lord has turned my heart because I, I didn't. And then I said, God, you got to help me. Why don't I like this? Well, probably because you can play by ear. When you can play by ear, sometimes you don't think you need the theory, right? Well, no, you need it all the more, and especially jazz musicians are great at it. But it was Rita Houck. She's a, um, she's a piano teacher, and she's now in Kansas. Yeah. But she really turned it for me. She's a piano Suzuki teacher trainer. 
and her games just won me over. I'm like, wow. oh, this is fun. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to do the with the kids. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, I want us to I want us to focus on two things. Um, so I'll kind of throw them, and y'all choose the order. <laughs> okay, first, just the calling that God has, the, just that calling that he's been expediting in your life that you have to pour into the zero to six-year-olds. Because so many parents say, what can I do to keep my children away from the world? What can I do to empower them to be successful in the kingdom? And you all have an answer for that. So I think that's really, I want to address that. The other thing is that, that touched me so much, Tim, is just uh, the question to to families and 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 the question is where are the men mm. and and men god needs you and wants to use you in family worship mm. because so many feel ill-equipped mm. and they want to they don't know how to and i know that god has used you mm. to help so many men position their family they that you have kind of debunked myths and fears so I just want to throw that out there and then whichever one you want to address first, but I think those are two really, really important things to discuss today. Well, it, it is really a core value in our hearts for worship. Yeah. We have a saying in our family, things go better with praise. Amen. You know, and, it, and it's not to trivialize that, but it's worship, volunteer worship. We never have this opportunity again yeah. to be able to have volunteer worship in our hearts and we look at David's life and we see how he 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 lived that lifestyle and there's a huge blessing and benefit in that when we worship God comes mm -hmm. so the presence of God always comes and one thing we found when we worshiped as a family is that he always did come yeah and there were times when it was an ebb and flow. You feel strong, and then you don't always feel it as strong, but you know he's there. And um, so worship, voluntary worship, brings the presence of the Lord. Yeah. But it also causes us to know him when he comes. He starts to reveal himself. Yeah. And as that happens, then we want to praise him more. Yeah. And you're looking at David like he's... He's saying, you know, to Nathan the prophet, he says, I'm in a cedar house, and the, and the ark is in a tent, and I don't feel good about that. And it's like, God heard that yeah. and said, I heard that initiative. You're, you're actually wanting to build me a house? Oh. And God just loves that initiative. I think yeah. he responded to that and said, well, I'm going to establish your house forever. Yeah. So I just feel like when we worship God as a family, it doesn't get any better yeah. than, than that. Because as we worship, it's like we touch our eternal destiny. Yeah. You know, it's like it goes back, it goes present, and it goes future when we worship. So, Tim, how do you encourage the man that feels intimidated or threatened or they just don't, they feel ill-equipped to lead their family in worship? Maybe they're not musical. Maybe they didn't grow up with Christian parents. Maybe they don't really understand the value of praise. How do you speak to them and position them? Well, I would like to just address the men to say it is totally worth the effort yeah. and and it starts with your relationship and the word just yeah. being in the word daily and also just embracing humility because we as as dads and as husbands first we have to walk in humility and avoid that foot of pride and by just saying god help show me how this yeah. is to look in my family because every family has an identity and he wants to help. The Holy Spirit is right there to help every father. And so the father is the worship leader of the family, but he can just set the tone by just setting a time and a place and just gently enforcing that. Yes. You know? And that's, that's one of the roles that, that fathers have yeah. in, a, in a gentle but firm way. Hey, we're going to do this. Yeah. So I just think it's important that they not feel inadequate. It doesn't require musical skill, yeah. but it... It's all about their heart uh, pressing into God and just modeling their worship. You yeah. know, it just, you can do a lot with a CD or it can be just a, a simple box drum yeah. and, and a couple of singers. I mean, it's, it, it doesn't take um, a huge, um, yeah. you know, initiative of skill. Yeah. Yeah. All you need is four or five chords. Yeah. But it's not about the skill level. Of course, you have a lifetime to develop your skill. Sure. 
But let me just say that our boys didn't come running, oh, yay, we get to worship. <laughs> no, it didn't happen. It was like, Dad said, you come. Yeah. Obedience first time, not second or third. And most of the time, they did not want to do it. But afterwards, they were so glad. Yeah. We could yeah. feel this blanket of covering coming over oh, us. Just <laughs> Wow. Um, and, and it did change the atmosphere of our home. It, it did. It, it did. And, it, and I'm so thankful that he would always, hey, let's do it. He would set the chairs around in the living room. When we, actually, when we first moved to IHOP, that's when we started. We didn't know what we were doing. He set us around and we said, okay, so let's start with the worship song. Okay, so we all played unison and he on the guitar, everybody on violins. At that time, they all played violins. And then he said, okay, let's say a verse. We, they would each say a verse, like we would pick ahead of time. And then they would say the verse and they said, okay, now let's just play. And we didn't know what we were doing. And we all took turns playing. They would say, say a verse, play, say a verse, play. Each one would take the yeah. turn. And then we would play, finish with the worship song. That's it. That was a simple recipe. But, and then from there, we, we grew. Yeah. Our language grew. But just in regard to skill, I wanted to say one more thing. that it, You don't have to play an instrument to be able to establish that culture in your right. family. And like in the car, we would just sing. Yeah. And even in our last camp, we had a men's track where Aww. we encouraged the men to be the worship leaders in their family. And we just sang a cappella together. And it was amazing. The men, we, we just got addicted to that in yeah. that short period of time over wow. that week to just sing simple worship songs a cappella together. Yeah. And if you get a little beatbox in there or hey. a little percussion, I mean, and <laughs> singing. Good. Good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. <laughs> that, that, that's the... That's the Beatbox 101. Right I like it. I like it. Um, well, I, I want to say, I, I haven't said it yet, but look, if you're interested and you want to know more, go to brocksupperroom.org. That's the website. And there's information, bringing them to your church, talking to them about a camp, finding out some of the, the books they recommend and the curriculums they rep recommend, hearing about family camp, and also just about this new passion on your heart. And that is this assignment to work with children zero through six. So we only have a few minutes, but I just kind of want you to share how God gave that to you and how you're unpacking it, because that's so important. You said a quote yesterday, Melody, about um, between zero and seven, they belong to the Lord, right? Is that what you yeah, said? I think it's zero to six, but yeah. same yeah. idea, yeah. same idea. We heard, heard this from a friend of, of Tim's that was uh, talking with us, and Really, it's wet cement. Yeah. And so when we raised our boys, I was like, Lord, show us how to do this. And yeah. so we would put CDs on, you know, Mozart, all the classics, yeah. you know, and it really, our first is really smart. Yeah. <laughs> Not that the others aren't, but, yeah. you know, you, you're just focusing both of us on that one. And then I thought, huh, what about the second one? We, we put the word of God more on him. Yeah. He loves the word. Yeah. You know, but of course, that's all. But I think there's something to do, and Tim, you can probably answer this better, but for me, I've, I avoided it before five and six years old because they couldn't obey first time. Yeah. But I feel like the Lord is saying, no, right now, it's time to focus on the zero to six, three to six particularly. Yeah. Uh, and that's when you can, they're wet cement. They can do things even easier than at seven and eight. Yeah. You, you, you used to be have to wait till seven and eight years old, so you can read the music and whatever, but you learn a language at two and three years old. You're right. Zero, one, two, three. Right. So. And you see all these prodigies and from different countries where they, they might not have all the, the cultural issues and the woke issues and where they do raise up the little guys that are doing, you know, mm. the, the m social media has given us an opportunity to see these little tiny ones that are doing extraordinary things in music. That's really special. So do you have a curriculum? Do, how do you teach? How do you impart? How are you, is it mostly through the family camps that you're helping uh, parents be positioned to teach the young ones? Well, it's Suzuki method. Okay. It's just this, and so um, I would encourage people to read Ability Development okay. from Age Zero by Dr. Suzuki. That gives a, a, an overview. Um, but there's Suzuki CDs. 
where you're listening and when you listen to the music you can get it and then when you learn with the Suzuki method it's really not Suzuki method if you just use the books you yeah. need to have the group interaction parent education and lessons and I actually when they're really little I do twice a week yeah. at the beginning stages and then of course once a week and it's just um, you know you, step by step and with the little ones you got to do it so small steps mm. and it's got to be fun fun yes. is candy if yes it's fun and easy they love it so we're embarking on a new journey <laughs> well that's key is making it fun because so often i think children turn away from things because of the intensity and the pressure and the 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 rigor and you know rah you got to practice your piano that was my but life but you do it together it's the mother tongue method so where there's lots of applause every time they play and every time they yay even though it's not right you're applauding and then because you're you're not saying don't do this don't do that yes well, I used to, my piano teacher used to smack my knuckles with a ruler if oh. I did something wrong. So there's no fun in that. It's nurtured by love. Yeah. That's, that's and every child can. Yeah. Every child can learn Japanese. Every child can learn English, Chinese, whatever. And isn't that the heart of Jesus, that everything we do, we want to nurture with love? Mm -hmm. Well, Melody, Tim, you guys are amazing. I love this method. It's fascinating. We're going to have you uh, play and, 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 and worship and introduce our audience to that in future episodes. But I just want to give you a chance. We have just a few seconds left to just pray however you feel led with the viewers today. So, Lord, I just ask for each family and for the, for the fathers and for the mothers, uh, for those single parent families as well, Lord, I just ask for your encouragement and grace on them that, that you would help them to establish that, that time and place and that you would bring these, these two things together, Lord, of just, just the fun of learning, learning language at an early age, but the language of love, which is to worship you even from an early age, even like Samuel, who was maybe three years old when he started in the temple, Lord, we ask that you would raise up families that would have the value to raise priests and that in their priestly ministry, they would do great things and have a lifestyle of worship. God, we're asking for worship to be restored in the family and for the fathers to take that place of leadership and for grace to do that. Jesus. Amen. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Look them up, connect with them, pray for them. Music is the language of heaven. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jen Mallon. Come home. Mm -hmm.